basis, uh, a collected book, which is uh, one of the most important ones in our bibliography, going through our project. But uh, today is going to talk about animal faces, uh, the question of the gaze. So, yes. what is your perspective? Thank you, and uh, I benefit from this uh, introduction to show you, uh, to make some branding. If you want to take a bookmark, please take it. I don't have enough with me. Design. And now I want to apologize because I have no real text. I have like a Bilder Atlas Mnemosine, like from Abi Warburg. So I, I provide a hypnotic atmosphere, like uh, Edgar Morin said, the beholder must be in the dark, it's not the darkness. Um, this first quotation as an epigraph from Empedocles is just there to show uh, the prominence of the eyes in a, as a proto-face element. So when the body is dismembered in this uh, primeval cosmogony, and when the face is carved up, the eyes are still there, or still uh, like a salient part of the organism, precisely because they bear a potential gaze as to me, or, or the absence of it. So the eyes would be like a rigid designator, as Saul Kripke said about the proper names. So um, this was also the point of view uh, by Deleuze. Due to the primacy of the eyes inside the organicity of the face, the eyes play a decisive role in recognizing a face or the absence of it, and Deleuze uh, already emphasized on the eyes inside the, his abstract and despotic facing machine, uh, which was an, uh, an, um, a system, white wall and black hole, a system of significance and subjectivity. So the minimal face bears eyes, eyes as black hole. Also, if you take the Cheshire cat beginning to fade away, uh, for me, the face is still there till the eyes are inside. As soon as you see only the mouth, there is no face anymore. So what is now the distinction between f uh, eyes and a gaze? The, eyes has, the eye has a function to see, but the gaze has a valency to express an affect. And I am grateful to Massimo Leone for making this distinction in other semiotic fields between function and avail valency. Um, so the, the, valen the, um, sorry, the, the function of the eye is also directed inwards outwards, whereas uh, the valency of the gaze is directed outwards inwards. There is no gaze when it's not considered from outside as a gaze. You see it in this uh, example uh, of Alex undergoing experimental aversion therapy for his rehabilitating crimin uh, for rehabilitating criminals. Uh, his eyes are clamped open and forced to watch films of sex and violence. So, is it this? Is do we have to do with the gaze or with eyes? I think with both of them. As uh, according to Paul Valéry. Uh, the eyes are the organ of vision, of, uh, yes, but the gaze is an act of forecasting. The gaze is always something dynamic, something uh, aspectual, with, full of expectations. Could we then say that uh, the gaze uh, can be seen as a perversion of the physiological uh, tendency of the use of the eyes, of its final cause in Aristotle's terms. Because we could say that the eyes have the purpose to see, final cause, telos, goal, but the efficient cause, the agency to look, the agent which drives a transient motion, kinum in Greek. And from this perspective, we could say that the gaze gives the eyes, the gaze gives the eye uh, a radiancy, a blinking, uh, as Maria Giulia showed this morning, which is traditionally linked to the beauty, to beauty as a conformity with, between human and the divine. So the hypothesis 
But then afterwards, I will dis deconstruct this hypothesis, is that the gaze normalizes, neutralizes, or humanizes the subject. So the deviancy of a body tends to be canceled by an intense or penetrating gaze. And a non-human endowed with a gaze switches to the human. And we have the example that a professor this morning showed us about the Lamb of God in the uh, altarpiece by Van Eyck, which after restoration uh, disveiled this frontal, almost human gaze of the Lamb according to the symbol of Christ. But this uh, frontal gaze uh, converts also the muzzle into an almost anthropomorphic muzzle. So everything becomes anthropomorphic as soon as the gaze is a human one, as soon as the eyes become a gaze. So we need to do some semiotic distinctions uh, very simply, actually, like, uh, do we have heads without faces? Yes, we have them in uh, Bacon's painting. We spoke of this about uh, this morning already, that he advocated to undo the face, to extract the head beneath the face, to shake the face, um, and to remove, uh, the head has to shake uh, and remove his face from the body. Uh, yes, and so on. We have also in fashion, heads without faces in design, in some religions. Second category, we have eyes without gazes, and this could be disturbing, or at least uh, struggling. Uh, like the problem which was uh, for, um, for Darwin, um, something which left him um, uh, in, uh, like uh, which um, the side of a feather makes me sick, he said, uh, because um, it was against the Victorian idea that beauty is God-given he discovers that the peahens are attracted by this extravagant plumage and that they have like an aesthetic sense and that it's not a question of struggle for life or of uh, natural selection, but a, a question of struggle for mates, that the females have uh, the, uh, the chance to make their own choice so that beauty is not God-given. Uh, another theory recently says that the peahens pay no attention to the tail and the eye spots on the tail, that there is no correlation between the number of eye spots and the reproductive success. But still, um, it's interesting to see that there are a lot of eyes without gazes, also in a metaphoric sense that the word eye used metaphorically indicates something um, in invincible or sacred or express the radical authority like something devilish as in this uh, bull-like uh, helmets um, or in this Inuit mask where, where the human is behind an animal uh, mask. Other case of an eye uh, without a gaze uh, is the one stressed by, um, interrogated by Bart, which shows that the gaze is culturally determined. Um, the eyelets seem to be, for us, for Western uh, beholders, seems to be inherent uh, to our conception of the gaze. So in um, the Japanese um, eye, there is no real eyelet, or at least the eyelet is a flat, and there is no a dramatic orbit, so there is less expressive value that we find in this, uh, um, in this eyelet, in these rings around the eyes, and there is absence of thoughtfulness, pensivité. Or as a professor this morning uh, told us also, that it's difficult to see oneself, so the self-portrait is uh, something uh, it's at the origin of drawing, says Derrida, and it's together drawing and withdrawal, so we can play on the, on the words, because there is always a blind spot. You cannot together draw and see yourself, so there is um, a mutual exclusion between 
seeing and drawing. Uh, and he was himself suffering from facial paralysis when he wrote this book. So he was deprived of his twinkling. And that's the reason of this uh, idea of blindness and drawing. We have the case of heads with <coughs> gaze without faces. So a gaze can be dissociated from the face, like in this Victor Hugo examples, where um, we have, so uh, for example, the condemned to death, we have the head uh, cut by the executioner, but rolling amongst other heads and having a gaze. Or we have the encounter between the fisherman in his fight with the octopus in the toilets of the sea, where we have uh, together a stylistic chiasm and a, a chiasm of vision. Uh, when two eyes were gazing and the eyes were fixed on Julia, Julia recognized the octopus. We can have, of course, uh, examples of gazes without eyes. And that's always linked with something uncanny, the uncanny of Freud, the déjà vu, the wolf man, the wolf man, this Russian boy, a uh, boy with wolf phobia, who dreams about wolves staring at him and uh, susciting a feeling of guilt. It's always linked to a certain vulnerability of the subject because the look can be also in a rustling of branches, said Sartre in the sound of a footstep, in uh, the opening of a curtain. So it's not necessarily linked to eyes. And worse, if I grasp the gaze, I don't see the eyes anymore. And if I grasp a gaze, I, I'm not able to tell if the eyes are beautiful or not. There is a, like a switch, one or the other. Um, so there is also the case of faces without gazes, of blind faces or masks. Uh, the, 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 yes, the gaze can become a gape when the mouth is open. Uh, when the eyes are still frontal, there is always a disturbing potential gaze, also when it's a doll, for example. Uh, of course, we spoke this morning on, about the funeral mask, but we didn't speak about the closing of the eyes or the opening of the eyes in these masks. So a mask, according to Bart, is an addition of lines. The face is a thematic relation between them. So it's a question of uh, difference between inertia and movement. And when um, a, an Italian group made a new funeral mask uh, of, of Dante, they said they, undoed, uh, they restored his humanity because they opened his eyes, of course, and it, they endowed the mask with a potential gaze, you could tell. And I alluded this morning to this Givaro shrinking of heads of enemies, where you maintain the identity, and that's perhaps the reason they sued, they stitched the eyelids together uh, to maintain, because there is a potential gaze still in it, and they want to maintain the identity um, um, what, what is not the case in other Amazonian trophy heads because they precisely want to adopt, to appropriate this identity of the, of the, of the enemy. Um, so then you could, uh, we could switch to uh, effigies, of course, and the spectrality of facial surgery and um, from this absence of gaze in, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the masks and in the artworks uh, alluding to facial surgery or to uh, spectrality. And so it would be a little uh, <laughs> easy, and, and, but I think we, there is something missing in this facial recognition and this facial recognition precisely deprives the eye from its gaze. So it uh, <coughs> ignores the gaze and uh, switches to necropolitics uh, through this. And the morphing of uh, faces to uh, come to the average face 
uh, for uh, beauty reasons or for a uh, composite photograph reasons for um, what we told this morning for forensic reasons they all lose somewhere the gaze um, there is something uh, we spoke about the blurring of the periphery but in the central there is always something missing the gaze also uh, this composite portrait of criminals uh, delivered finally uh, the beauty the average ugly equates the beauty the beauty but uh, an, an inhuman beauty something without gaze and what we see in these movies uh, in these movies such as Minority Report, in the cyberpunk action thriller, which, uh, with this pre-crime uh, police, like a preventive police, uh, which wants to stop murders before they act, is once again uh, a focus on these eyes because the, the character has to undergo a risky eye transplantation to avoid the, the recognition system but what we lose is what uh, Hitchcock showed is this vortex this movement in the uh, pupil so now we we stress inside the gaze on the pupil uh, which is essential is this um, flickering of the pupil inside the gaze which we have in the Saul Bass opening credits. And uh, in, by, in parentheses, this is the first use of the digital image in a, in a movie. It's the Saul Bass uh, vertigo. Mm -hmm. So what we lose is precisely um, the titillation of the gaze, this kinetic mobile physiognomy uh, described in one of the authors of this book about uh, an, a passage of uh, Proust uh, du côté de chez Swann where Le Grandin, the secondary character, gives a sideways glance to, uh, to Marcel, which requires a, a very sophisticated semiology because it's a sideways glance inside the eyelet, let, with a certain pupil and so on. So if we don't go to this depth, uh, analyzing the gaze, we lose something of the whole face. And so we can switch to the animal because um, the encounters with animals and with their potential gaze, and it's still a question for me, call into uh, or better deconstruct any claims for human exceptionality. So we almost uh, fall into specious loneliness, it's a term by Harrison. Uh, when Derrida stages his disquieting experience of meeting non-human eyes, we, um, he expresses the whole discomfort uh, in presence of animals, which always urges us to legitimize our culture our status of human beings, our anthropocentric knowledge. Um, so perhaps the cats, uh, uh, which um, disturbs our, uh, our pre prejudices about uh, our uh, human um, condition, becomes like a, a sphinx who pushes us to an inverse hermeneutics because what is a sphinx is a being asking questions to a human and summon him to answer on pain of death so this absolute otherness um, shows the limits of our knowledge of ourselves that's a little the message of derrida they their, the opaqueness of their uh, mystical gaze um, and the possible chiasm with such animals uh, shows our species loneliness and we have this already in Baudelaire when he speaks about uh, as an allegory of the poet of the Prunel mystique of the cats, the mystical pupils uh, their 
gem, gem-like pupils, the inexplicable power, this opacity of this absolute other. And we have this also in this marvelous book by uh, Sylvain Tesson, who, who went interrogating on the lookout in, uh, à la fuite, in wait for a snow panther uh, in Tibet in 4,000 um, meter high, and he never saw or almost never saw this panther. But developing a, a picture two months later, they discovered he was there. He was there on the edge of the rock, and they never saw him before. He was there. He was there with his deux cristaux de mépris. It's a personification, you will say, but a crystal of contempt. Uh, this threat in the animal gaze converts the, it into a gaze. And perhaps there is no ontological difference between the animal and the human gaze. If we see this uh, Kubrick gaze, this ominous stare uh, of the actor uh, with his he head tilted down and looking up beneath his eyeballs, staring directly into the camera. So um, the gaze is not only a pupil, a twinkling pupil, but is also a question of eyebrows, of a whole grammar of expressions uh, um, in, interrogated by this little esoteric uh, pedagogue, which was uh, François del Sartre, or already through uh, Deleuze and Eisenstein. But the question now is, <laughs> Are they really endowed with a gaze, or are, do they only have eyes, the animals? According to Heidegger, in the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, world finitude and solitude, you know this uh, quotation when he says, the stone is wordless, the animal is poor in world, and the man is world forming. We find this in the ethologist um, Jakob von Uxkull, when he says that the animal colors diff each animal colors differently uh, his uh, environment, his umwelt, and operates perceptive selections or inhabits a distinctive uh, umwelt. Uh, but uh, it's partly true because um, we have to take into account the, the teleology, the endogene factors, which were already in Aristotle, each species. Uh, does something in order to achieve survival, and also the adaptation, the Darwin point of view, the exogene adaptedness, and that mutation arises by chance, and that the behavior patterns and even the shape of the eyes is linked to the, to the pattern. The predators have a more binocular vision and the prey has a peripheral vision, or the, 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 the fly has another vision. Um, and then in these um, uh, court uh, dances, um, we have, in the courtship dances, we have sometimes a dance with the eye or a dance with a fake eye. So it's much more complicated in animals, perhaps, than in human beings. Because, and, um, or we can have also um, a, a, a hybrid between uh, animal and human gaze inside uh, one ontological entity, for example, the nightmare. The nightmare is itself a mare, a horse, female. So uh, in this incubus, we see a dreaming woman and the content of her nightmare together. Um, all this uh, leads me to, um, to speak about this uh, very interesting uh, artist, Binom, which show hybrids or pandrogen almost between human and animal, where uh, animal gazes and human gazes are interchangeable. And they work together on distance. So one sends his work to the, the one is photographer, the other is drawer, and they work together and they send the work. One is South Africa, the other in the Netherlands, and this final uh, result is like this. Or we have the same uh, experiment when Rebecca Horn stages um, a, a dialogue between herself and a cockatoo uh, through shot reverse shot. And she imitates the bird's expressions till uh, the, the gaze of the animal of the cockatoo blinks. 
and now I come almost to my conclusion. Uh, I will spare you the, and I lost the page of, <laughs> because you are vegan, uh, no, uh, you're right to be vegan because the, uh, <laughs> the callop has 200 eyes fringing the edge of its shell. The, when you eat a callop, you eat 200 eyes. Uh, so there is um, this plasticity of visual systems we saw already. It's genetically programmed, but there is always interaction with the environment, which has been proved through Jean-Pierre Changeux and also Michel Imbert. They both go back to this experiment by Hubel Wiesel, who took newborn kittens and trained them in controlled environment. So they trained them to selective, through selective deprivation. So they stitched one eyelet or they covered one eyelet and they showed that uh, it led to a profound visual defect, to a cortical deficit. And from this, they go to cultural deficits if you deprive a child from a reading and so on. So this empiricist interpretation uh, which relates uh, the, the gaze to uh, a response habit to cultural or ecological factors in the visual environment could be interesting for us uh, because then you pass uh, you arrive at the theory of the selective stabilization. So these are all arguments to speak about gaze. It's not only a question of eyes, it's a, a question of usage of eyes. And usage of eyes is not only to see, it's to, um, to metabolize the environment. So I come, is it too early or too late? I, I come to my perfect, conclusion perfect, perfect. that um, the gaze is perhaps the indiscernibility, the shared element we have with animals. And this against the man's exceptionalism, that uh, we should perhaps uh, discover our common engagement with the world through not only the Devenir Animal by Emile uh, Plateau de Luz Guattari about this <coughs> indiscernibility, uh, but in the idea of respecting, of concern, which both words are uh, using something about to look, look to, to consider a face-to-face -face between human and animals and between uh, both gazes. Thank you. Thank you.